Hi, hello, and welcome to the College of Continuing Education's webinar on Navigating Effectively Through Conflict. My name is G. McLeod, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I have a couple little logistics to go through before we begin. So what I'd like you to do, we're going to invite you to submit questions throughout the hour, and uh, Stephanie will uh, answer the questions at the end as time permits. In order to do so, please submit them on the upper left hand portion of the screen and click on Ask a Question button. Then just type your question and click Send. Uh, one other thing to note is that we're going to be doing a link to this recording, so it will be emailed to all of you who have registered in the next couple of days. More importantly, I'm here really to introduce Stephanie McGovern. She is going to be the instructor or the person leading the webinar today. Stephanie holds a master degree in industrial relations from the Carlson School of the University of Minnesota. She has a coaching certification through the Hudson Institute of Santa Barbara. She has certified Myers-Briggs situational leadership and leadership effectiveness training as well on conflict dynamics profile, which according to Stephanie is designed to help you increase your conflict confidence. Stephanie is currently a founder and president of an organization dedicated to maximizing individual, team, and organizational performance. In her work, she applies skills and strategies that have been proven to be effective with over 20 years of corporate experience. During that time, she demonstrated skills developing leaders, grading, uh, high-performance teams, coaching, facilitating, conducting needs assessments, and doing lots of training. I have to admit that over the years, I have really enjoyed working with Stephanie because she has, um, is really passionate what she does and best of all, has a contagious sense of humor. She has been teaching all sorts of courses here at the uh, College of Continuing Ed from leadership to organizational development to coaching over the years and she's just been terrific to work with. With no further ado, please join me in welcoming Stephanie. Thank you, Jean. I'm very glad to be with all of you and welcome. Um, just start off with a little thought for the day here. Taking time to do nothing often brings everything into perspective. And uh, unfortunately, if your life is like mine, oftentimes we don't have time during the day to really get that perspective. So just uh, congratulate yourselves for taking this hour to kind of step back and look at situations that you might be in that um, you might be able to deal a little bit more effectively by just uh, looking at it maybe from a slightly different angle. So we're going to be exploring uh, conflict from that, uh, that topic. So um, I'll tell you just a little bit about my background um, and what got me into the, the conflict area. Um, my, I've worked a lot in the area of leadership development and coaching, and especially in the hour of, or area of really helping people develop power their personal power, organizational power, their ability to influence to really achieve outcomes that they want to uh, achieve at work. And um, one of the things I discovered when working with power is that if we're going to work with power, we need to understand what trips our own sense of powerlessness. Because I believe that we're really powerful people that experience moments of powerlessness from time to time. And conflict often are those situations that trip a sense of powerlessness, where we're really not at our best at a time where we actually need to be at our best. So um, I, we're going to be exploring that about how do you really enhance your own sense of power to really deal with conflict effectively. And when I was first introduced to dealing with conflict, I was doing it as a third party conflict, uh, you know, person who was facilitating conflict between two other people. And I always thought I was pretty good at it. And then I started looking at, but how am I good, am I good at dealing with my own conflict with people and decided that I wasn't very good and wanted to get better at it. So the goal of this session really is to help you get better at conflict that you're personally involved in. It may also translate to help you with conflict between other people that you might end up mediating at times. Um, but I always think the first step is to really understand our own patterns with conflict and develop our own conflict competence. So the uh, objectives for the session is we're going to look at some natural responses we have to conflict. 
And there may be types of situations that you're in where some conflicts don't you know, you can really navigate your way through pretty easily where others really throw you. A lot of times people say it's when I'm involved with anybody that has like a authority over me or authority figures or something, sometimes I have a hard time dealing with conflict or um, whatever those situations are for you. We're going to be looking at what are those natural responses you have to conflict. And we're going to look at seven behaviors that actually help us resolve conflict. And some of these might come quite naturally to you. And it's just an awareness to reinforce, yeah, I do do these well. And then um, maybe some that you don't do as much and help you in terms of really thinking how you might apply those. And then eight behaviors that really get in the way of dealing with conflict. And sometimes these are often very subtle. We don't even know that we're doing them. So we'll be exploring that. And then finally, we're going to be looking at hot buttons. And these are actually triggers that often get us into conflict. And um, there are ways that we get kind of emotionally charged about a situation. And we'll look at what your particular hot buttons are and how that um, gets in your way of dealing with conflict and how to deal with that maybe just a little bit more effectively. So I don't know if you can recognize any of these uh, phrases, uh, if they resonate with you. Uh, but I've heard these a lot. I've said them myself. Um, things like, uh, boy, my life would just be easier if other people could deal with conflict better. I wish they would get better at dealing with conflict. Or, gosh, you know, in the heat of the moment, I often either freeze and don't know what to say in conflict, or I lash out and then regret it afterwards. Or where you might get emotionally triggered because of conflict at work and you think, oh, it's not appropriate to get you know, emotional. I need to you know, squelch this or not deal with this or avoid this. Um, or just you know, training sometimes we've had, well, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. So then we just don't confront the issue. We leave it alone and we hope it'll all go away. And uh, uh, oftentimes it doesn't. It actually just gets bigger. So if you recognize any of those in yourself or you might have some other th ways of, of you know, yourself that you know probably aren't the best way of dealing with conflict, we're going to be looking at different ways to deal with it more constructively. So just some facts about conflict. I mean, if you think of um, the workplace that was uh, existed about 20 years ago, uh, not near as much collaboration as we have today. When I first started my career, it was very easy, um, you know, for maybe an engineer in a company to kind of sit in a corner and do their job and not have to have much people interaction. Today, it's, our work is really designed um, around interaction with people, and we need to collaborate in terms of problem solving and meeting customer needs and all sorts of things. So in the midst of that, conflict is inevitable. It's going to happen. So we might as well find some easy, simple ways of dealing more effectively with it. Another interesting statistic I came across was that 65% of performance problems at work are directly related to strained relationships with other employees. And not because you know, we don't have skill or motivation to do our job, but it's because sometimes conflicts get in the way and we don't want to step into that conflict to deal with it. And so we avoid it and it looks like we're not taking initiative or we're not dealing constructively with something. Um, and it's not coming from lack of motivation, it's just coming from the sense of we don't quite know what to do. So poorly managed conflict, and if you think of this in terms of impact organizationally, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, you know, reduces our decision quality, um, you know, it, it, our own engagement. If you think of employee engagement in terms of um, people withdrawing, just, you know, saying, well, okay, I'm just going to kind of sit back because I don't want to step into this conflict. Uh, just communication that gets shut down because of conflict. Uh, I worked with a, a group one time early on in my career, and uh, two people were team leads of two different functional areas in an organization. And uh, I went in to do some team building with them. And I said, well, what's going on? And they said, the, the people on the team said, well, the two team leads um, don't, don't talk with one another. In fact, if one calls and the other one answers, the other one hangs up the phone. And, and so it's like when we get into conflict, oftentimes we shut down communication and it just ends up escalating our stories and our assumptions about people rather than getting things cleared up. And obviously it has an impact on innovation. 
um, reduces time and you know increases all sorts of costs. If you think of the the stress that happens when we're we're we dealing with conflict, um, the impact on us physically, emotionally. Um, has lots of implications for us at work. So lots of good reasons to get better at it. So some assumptions that we're going to be working with in the session is, is uh, unfortunately, we can't control other people's behavior. And it's very easy to get focused on what other people should do. But the reality is, and I'm sure you've experienced this, change comes from changing ourselves. And that if we're looking at someone else to change in order for us to resolve the situation or for it to be better, we're probably likely to wait a long time. And that we can actually have a very productive impact by just changing the way we look at something, changing an attitude, changing a tone of voice, all those things can uh, really help the situation. Um, conflict is often tricky because it has an emotional component. And when that part of our brain is tripped, we're often not at our best problem solving uh, ability. So that's another piece we're going to look at. And that conflict competence is about creating more awareness and choice in the moment so that we can deal more effectively with whatever is going on. So I'm going to show you some optical illusions and then we're going to talk a little bit about what this has to do with conflict. So looking at this, kind of ask yourself, is this even possible? And with this one, uh, count the black dots on your screen. See if you can uh, come. My screen looks like they're changing. They keep changing. Um, are the horizontal lines parallel or do they slope? What does it look like from your angle? How many legs does this elephant have? Again, for me, it keeps changing. Uh, if you look at these, do these look stationary or are they moving? And visually, they look like they're moving. Um, in actuality, they are stationary. And if you look at these, uh, which uh, dot in the middle is uh, bigger, the right or the left? And in actuality, they are the same size. And uh, you should see an outline of a man's face here. And you should also, if you look kind of sideways, see the word liar written in cursive. So interesting that we've got these different ways of looking at, you know, the, the same thing. And, and we probably experience this every day. If you think of coming out of a meeting and talking with someone about your impression and they have a totally different impression, even though you were in the same meeting. Um, or they heard something totally different. So we just see things differently. And when we see things differently, um, oftentimes we start assuming that there's something wrong with that versus getting curious about it. And here's a quote from the Dalai Lama. Uh, he says, people take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. Just because they're not on your road doesn't mean they've gotten lost. But Oftentimes, that's what we assume, a difference comes up, and rather than getting curious about that and trying to learn from each other or, or see things from different perspectives, we often start um, what catalyzes a conflict. Now, the definition of conflict we're going to be using here, and uh, this is from uh, Rundy and Flanagan, 2007, any situation in which people have incompatible interests, goals, feeling, principles, or feelings. So a key word here to look at is incompatible. So we can have a difference on something. We can just see things differently from different points of view, and we can agree to disagree. Uh, but if, for some reason, it seems like in order for me to get what I want, um, you need to change or you need to see something differently for us to agree or I need to see something differently, that's when we, it appears we've got incompatible interest. And that's what starts to escalate um, into conflict. So conflict is difficult for us because uh, most often when conflict is triggered, there is an emotional component. If there's not emotion present, oftentimes that means we just have a difference. And if we have a difference, we can logically kind of work through it. How do you see it? Oh, I see it this way. Okay. Okay. What can we do about it? And, and usually we can work through it. But when emotions are triggered, it adds a whole nother dynamic uh, to us that we need to consider. 
Because when we're triggered emotionally, um, our creative problem solving part of our brain, which we need the most at that moment of conflict, tends to shut down. And we're starting to come from, and I'll talk about this in a little more in a, little, in a minute, more our reptilian brain and our limbic brain, which is uh, more the emotional part of our brain or more the survival part of our brain. And when conflict starts to emerge, oftentimes it's, it's challenging because the outcome is uncertain. We're not sure how it's going to turn out. Many times I've talked to people about why don't they step into conflict more, and they said, well, I don't know, I might make it worse. And because the outcome is uncertain, um, it puts us a little bit on edge, and we don't quite know how to navigate it. And then it often feels like our respect and self-esteem are at stake. And we're, again, we're not coming from our best self. Now, there's a couple things if we could just remember would really help us at that moment when conflict starts to emerge, but we often forget these. And the first one here is, uh, it says, not to spoil the ending for you, but everything's going to be okay. Now, often when we're in conflict, we don't feel that way. It feels like that uncertainty takes over, and uh, we start feeling, you know, kind of edgy and, and uh, a little bit anxious. And uh, the other one here, again, is by the Dalai Lama. Remember that not getting what you want is sometimes a wonderful stroke of luck. And when we're at that moment when conflict is emerging, we start to feel like, oh, no, I'm not going to get what I want. And either I've got to really come at it hard so I can get what I want, or I better back off and um, figure out some other way because I don't know how to deal with this or, or work with this. And so because we lose sight of that, um, we go into some, some probably different parts of our brain we're going to talk about. And this is based on um, David Rock's brain research, and some of you may have heard of this, but he did some uh, work around what are five biological needs that are wired into us as human beings. Now, these aren't five you know, human needs that just because um, we want to be nice to each other we consider. We are wired biologically with these. So the first one is status. And this is um, not necessarily um, a sense that I want to have a position higher than yours or something, but it's a basic sense of respect, that we want to be respected for who we are, for the opinion we hold, for you know how we see something. Uh, the second one is certainty that we're wired for certainty. And this one often, you know, for many of you in organizations that are going through lots and lots of change, this often is very difficult. And in times of certainty or in conflict, as I talked about before, it's not certain how the outcome is going to turn out. So this, um, this need is often challenged. The third one is autonomy. And it's the need to feel like we have a choice, that we have a say. And sometimes when we get into conflict, we feel like, uh-oh, we don't have a choice, that we're somehow limited and we don't have, um, we just don't have a, a way to kind of step in there and, and get what we want. And the fourth one is the sense of relatedness or belonging, that we feel like we want to belong to a group, that we have a place and that we will be welcomed. And um, the last one is a sense of fairness. And again, this isn't a sense that everybody has to be treated actually the same, but that in general, things seem fair. Now, you can imagine that conflict will, will threaten all of these at some level. So when we're working with conflict, we're really dealing with these kind of core biological responses um, that somehow we got to get a hold of in order to work through conflict constructively. So just a little bit about the brain. Um, so different parts of the brain. We've got the cere cerebrum, which is kind of the creative problem-solving part of our brain. And that's what we would love to be able to access more of when we're in conflict. And oftentimes that is the part of us that shuts down. The limbic part, which is the emotional part of our brain, which often gets triggered during conflict and uh, tends to you know, regulate emotion and mood. And, um, you know, emotion is something that often we're told at work isn't helpful. We need to kind of put that on the back burner. And so we're not always, um, we're not always, you know, have the emotional intelligence at times to really work through that. So 
the interesting thing I found about emotion is that emotion can really tell us what we care about, what we're passionate about. And so we want to listen to the emotion, but we don't want the emotion to kind of take over. And for those of you that are aware of emotional intelligence, there's a couple areas around emotional intelligence, which is the whole self-awareness piece about what am I feeling, what's going on with me, what's happening you know, for me, and then the ability to self-manage that. And how can I manage my response? And those two things are really going to be helpful as we work through conflict. And then the brainstem, which is more that reptilian part of our brain, which is, you know, survival, threatened. Um, we just get instinctual responses coming at, um, out sometimes when we're at this. And, and sometimes we need to from a safety perspective. I mean, it's totally appropriate at times if you, you're sensing conflict and you sense there's physical danger, you want that reptilian brain to step in and save you. But oftentimes it trips when it's not usually going to help us in terms of the best response. So some conclusions just before we get into the, the heart of it, uh, talking about conflict is that we can change the way we respond to conflict if we become more aware of it. Another thing about conflict um, is that it uh, conflict tends to unfold. It doesn't just happen all at once. We're in the middle of a conflict. It's like there's stages of conflict, and the more we can start becoming aware of it at early stages, the more we have um, a choice and a response over how to, to deal with it more constructively. And the more we know about our own response patterns, the better we are to kind of uh, equip to deal with the change and work with conflict. So just a little bit, a lot of the... Um, the research that I, I have talked about already and will talk about is based on the conflict dynamics profile. And it was developed by some psychologists at the um, Leadership Development Institute at Eckert College in St. Petersburg, Florida. It um, will, it tends to measure situations that trigger conflict, and we're going to call those hot buttons. And it also provides insight into specific behaviors that are your natural responses to conflict. And the, the CDP, as we'll call it, the Conflict Dynamics Profile, short for CDP, um, has a self-assessment version that you can take, but also a 360 version. And uh, really interesting to see how we think we deal with conflict, but also how other people think we deal with conflict. And I'll talk about that in terms of my own experience here in a little bit. It is used by the Center for Creative Leadership. And there's some, if you're interested just in the validation and results, um, it's in the Journal for Education and Educational and Psychology Measurement in uh, August 2004. So I want to talk a little bit about this idea of what happens when we get triggered in conflict. So uh, the, the people who were doing the research on the conflict dynamics profile found that there were um, different behaviors that other people did that tended to trigger emotional responses in us um, in conflict situations. And these they referred to as hot buttons. And the hotter the hot button, the more likely it is to produce some really strong emotion in us. And this automatic impulsive responding, so that instinctive reptilian brain response, and then increased tension in ourselves and in the situations. And it's almost like, almost like when we say, I can't stop myself. That's the sign that that response, you know, that somehow a hot button has been triggered. So, and I'm sure you can all think about situations, maybe even in the last week, where you have had a hot button triggered. And we're going to look at different, um, re some research they did around different things that trigger our hot buttons. So these are nine different hot buttons that the CDP found. And um, if you go to their website, and it's in the, the resource uh, 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 biography at the end, um, or bibliography, um, it will, uh, there's a little um, five-minute online thing you can tell that will uh, tell you your top uh, hot button. And, um, and it also, when you take the fuller version of the CDP, it gives you more um, information about your hot buttons. But so I'm just going to go through these, and as I read them and talk a little bit about them, just notice for you which ones of these really kind of give you that emotional charge. So again, 
none of these things are great. You know, nobody will be like, oh, would love to spend time with people that are like this. But some of these just will trigger us more than others. So um, people who are unreliable. So you can't count on them. They miss, they miss deadlines. They do, say they're going to do something and they don't follow through. So is that, you know, to hyper person, does that trigger you, to trigger your hot button? People who are overly analytical and they're, they tend to be perfectionists and they tend to really get into the details and analyze everything to death. And they focus on things that you might think are really minor issues and why is this person making such a big deal about this or that? That's that over, overly analytical type. Um, people who are unappreciative, that people will might be going the extra mile, doing things, and they just take people for granted. They don't notice. They don't ever say thank you. They just expect people to, uh, to do things. People who are aloof and uh, who they tend to um, just isolate. They don't seek input. Uh, they just tend to be very distant emotionally from people. Uh, people who are micromanaging. So they're, you know, constantly monitoring and, and, you know, checking up on others. And this is one I know I work with a lot of leaders and, and uh, employees that work with leaders. And this is one that often triggers people is that sense of micromanaging because people often feel like you don't trust them um, from this micromanaging place. Uh, Self-centered. So people who just look, it's all about me. It's all about me. I, uh, had a boss one time uh, very early on in my career who gave me some great feedback. He was very honest with me and very open, and I felt like he had my best interests at heart so I could listen to it. And uh, he, uh, I'd, be, I'd go to him and I'd be all upset because somebody didn't get me something or that I needed to complete a project. And he'd draw a circle on the board. He said, this is the universe, Stephanie. And then he'd put a dot in the middle, and he'd say, here's the center of the universe. And then he'd point to the dot and go, you are not here. And it was a really nice way of reminding me that there were lots of agendas and lots of things going on in the organization and that I really needed to take a step back and see it from other people's perspective. So, but those people who just seem like it's all about them um, sometimes can trigger us. The abrasiveness, um, people who are just arrogant. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows the TV show House, but uh, he, he often plays a very abrasive, arrogant uh, sarcastic kind of person. And then um, people who are untrustworthy. They just tend to exploit other people, take credit. Um, you know, you just don't quite know where they're coming from. They always feel like they kind of have a hidden agenda. Or uh, hostile people, people who just lose their temper and they yell. And they, you know, and sometimes you don't know, what, you know, what to expect from them, but they can get overtly um, you know, displaying anger and hostility toward people. So think for yourself which ones of these trigger you and, and which ones don't. And, uh, you know, again, you know, I've talked with people and, you know, some people say, well, don't all of these trigger everyone? They're not, you know, none of them are great. But some people say, well, people are aloof. Okay, they're aloof. You know, that's just the way they are. That doesn't bother me. But, boy, if they're overly analytical and they get stuck on these minor things that aren't important and we can't move on in a meeting, it drives me crazy. So figure out kind of what that is for you. So just some tips in terms of managing hot buttons because this will help us kind of get to a better place when, as we start to work through some of the dynamics uh, around conflict when we get triggered. Uh, center and breathe, again, easier said than done. I'm sure you've heard that. But just sometimes just being able to take a breath, um, really important. Take a break. And this is different than avoiding the conflict, and we'll see that in a minute. We'll, we'll talk about uh, some, some that avoiding is not a productive strategy, but just delaying responding for a moment is. Uh, notice your story. And I'm going to talk about this here in a minute uh, around this story piece about um, what are you actually telling yourself about what's happening and is it helpful or not? And be responsible for how you feel. A, a lot of times we say, well, that other person, they made me feel this way and they need to change so that I don't feel this way. Well, nobody makes us feel anyway. We're responsible for our reactions. Sometimes we need to create a new habitual response in the moment. And it might be breathing. It might be just, you know, taking a walk. Um, this, this, uh, Number six actually works for me in terms of uh, changing my posture. 
So sometimes if you are starting to feel triggered, sometimes just sitting up straighter or sometimes um, even relaxing into your chair or standing, you know, or doing something different physically can start to change the energy. So figure out what works for you. A lot of people say they like to just take a walk and get perspective. Whatever works for you, finding some way to manage that so then you can deal with the situation more constructively. So the conscious choice we have here is once you're triggered, this emotional trigger we have, what do you do with it? Do you take the high road or the low road? And I'm sure we can all think of situations where we've done both. And, um, you know, the low road feels good in the moment, but often doesn't have great productive outcomes for us. So sometimes in order to take the high road, we have to be able to see things from a little bit different perspective. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about a, a, a process that actually happens instantaneously a lot during the day. I call it making up stories, and we all do it. And uh, the thing of it is we don't think they're stories. We think it's reality. And this is how it works. We get a piece of data. Say somebody um, that we had a disagreement with in a meeting in the morning um, that we didn't quite work through or resolve uh, starts, um, we see them walking down the hall later on in the day, and they don't look at us. They, they're, they just look down at the ground or something. So the data we have is we had a disagreement in this meeting, and now this person won't make eye contact with me. The story we make up, so we can make up all sorts of stories about that. So we could make up a story about, wow, they're still really angry about that meeting and um, that, you know, boy, that's just such an over response and I can't believe they won't even look at me. Now, the action we might take is actually we might just say, well, fine, if they're going to be that way, then, you know, then I'm just going to do, you know, something where you might withdraw even more or you might feel really assertive and you might want to go, hey, what's going on? And you might actually overreact to the situation, and which is going to create a, a certain result. Now, what if I make up a different story and I say, okay, same data, had a disagreement in the meeting, won't make eye contact with me in the hall. What if my story is, boy, they must have a, a lot on their mind right now. And what if then the action I take afterwards is, is, is to go, hey, just wanted to follow up with you after that meeting, noticed you in the hall and you look like you had a lot on your mind. Um, you know, how, how are things going? It's going to create a whole different result based on the story I told about the data. So when we're looking at conflict, one of the key ways to change our response, our action, and then the result of that action is to really look at what is the story we're making up about the situation. And often when we're triggered from a hot button, our story is not very positive about the other person. And sometimes it's not positive about us either. We can be very hard on ourselves. So take just a, a moment and think of a, a conflict situation that you may have had recently and what actually happened. And think of it just in terms of the facts. What actually, what is the data that actually happened? And what is the story you made up about it? And then what are the possibilities that open up if you change or drop your story about it? So sometimes we can change the story. Sometimes we can just drop the story altogether and just go, oh, I guess I was making up a story about that. I don't really know. I don't really know how that person's feeling. I don't really know what, where they're at with this. Maybe I better go check it out. So starting to notice and interrupting that cycle can really help us manage hot buttons. So here's a quote from Deepak Chopra that I really like. It says, when you blame and criticize others, you are avoiding some truth about yourself. And I find it really helpful to remember in conflict situations that when all my attention gets focused out there on what other people are doing, there's something I need to look at about myself. And the, um, the behaviors we're going to talk about here, the seven constructive behaviors, eight destructive behaviors, um, that are base, the basis of the conflict dynamics profile are those things that we can really start to look at ourselves in terms of starting to change our behavior that may change the outcome for us. So first of all, let's look at the constructive behaviors. And these behaviors are divided into two different kinds of behaviors, active behaviors that we do overtly 
and passive behaviors that we do um, kind of internally that either help or hurt. So um, let's look at the constructive active. So the first one here is perspective taking. So it's the ability to really stand back and look at things from another perspective. Now think for yourself, is this something that I do really naturally or is this something that I often, you know, it's actually hard for me to see it from somebody else's perspective. And if it is, um, sometimes it might be good to find a touchstone with somebody that you know is to say, you know what, this happened, help me see this from another perspective so I can just deal with this a little bit more constructively. Uh, the second one here, constructive active behavior is creating solutions so that when a conflict comes up, rather than dwelling on where we're in conflict or have incompatible interests, start talking about, well, what could we do about it? What could, what could make it better? The third one is actually expressing emotion. So um, being able to express what's going on for you. So saying things like, um, you know what, I actually am really afraid we're not going to meet our deadline can help people understand where we're at. Versus oftentimes when we get in conflict, we get an anger response, either overtly or passively. And that anger response becomes kind of a, 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 the initial response, but there's an emotion underneath uh, that response that often gets covered up. And the more we can open that up and actually express that, and, and sometimes that makes us feel vulnerable, but it also helps the other person see things from our point of view and helps open up a more honest um, dialogue, sometimes that can really help with conflict. So expressing emotion constructively. And then reaching out. And this is after maybe the conflict has happened initially or at the very beginning of the conflict, circling back to the person and going, boy, I know in the meeting we were talking about this and you seemed uncomfortable with what we landed on. Can you tell me a little bit more about what's going on? Or here's where I was coming from and I just wanted you to know more about that. And I had a situation with a client once who I'd given her some dates for some training I was going to do. And then I, about two hours later, I realized, oh, my gosh, I'd already promised those to, to somebody else. And I called her back and I said, oh, can we change them? And she goes, well, I've already scheduled them and I've got the president coming to the, the training to kick it off. And, and she was upset. And this was a new client. And, um, and I said, boy, normally I could be more flexible on this. But this other thing I had previously scheduled, I just can't change. And. She said, well, fine. And, um, and I could tell, it's like, oh, I just don't want to leave it like that. And so I called her back just a little bit later, and I, I really didn't know what I was going to say, but I, just, I actually had just gotten my conflict dynamics results back, and it said I needed to reach out more after conflict. So, um, so I, I called her back, and I did a little perspective taking as well, and I tried to put myself in her shoes and say, well, if I were her, what would I be concerned about? And I thought, you know, I would be concerned that... I just hired this person, I don't know much about her, and that I don't know if I can depend on her because she just changed some dates on me. So I called her back and I said, you know, I just really want to apologize again. I said I have been in business for 12 years and I have only had to change dates like this one other time, and so I don't do this lightly. Um, and I, I know you don't know, know me that well, but I just want you to know that... Um, that you know, I, I do take this seriously, and I'm really sorry this happened. And she was very appreciative that I, I, I had reached out, and even though um, I couldn't change the dates, and she was able to change the dates, so it all worked out. Uh, but sometimes just reaching out to people and just saying, you know, just just after the thing, after you maybe have cooled down a little bit, or they have cooled down, and, and coming back at it. So constructive passive responses, just taking a little bit of time to reflectively think before we respond, and especially combined with this next one of delay responding. Now, this is different than avoiding. Um, sometimes we think we're delaying responding because we've, we're, we've, we've actually uh, delayed responding for three months, and uh, that, that would be avoiding. And, but we want to just delay responding till we can get clear and we can, we're not in that emotionally triggered place anymore. And then the adapting piece, you know, of just being willing to adapt, being willing to listen to somebody else's point of view and adapt and learn and, and say, see things from their perspective and have them see things from your perspective and then being able to work something out that, that works for both. 
Uh, let's look at the destructive ones. So um, the active destructive are winning at all costs. So those of you that are quite competitive and you really want to get in there, I've got a little bit of this in me um, of really trying to make it happen. And I will say that normally I would say I don't, this doesn't come out at work, but my husband would say at times it comes out at home that I really have this, boy, I want to, I want to win this and I'm going to keep trying to persuade and trying to, you know, get my way. Uh, displaying anger, which is different than, than expressing emotion. So displaying anger isn't saying I'm angry, I'm, you know, concerned, I'm frustrated. It's actually acting out the anger. And, and so this is what, you know, this is the, this could be yelling, this could be, um, you know, actually, you know, throwing things or, you know, something in, in nonverbal, acting it out in very uh, big, you know, obvious gestures nonverbally. And that can really uh, obviously be destructive in conflict. Demeaning others. And in this category, we've got things like sarcastic humor, which oftentimes we don't think of as demeaning, but people experience it as that. And then also um, eye rolling. Uh, when, when I got my 360 back on my, my conflict dynamics profile, this demeaning others was one of the areas I had to work in. And I was like, whoa, I don't think I do that. And as I was explaining this to my husband and we were reading the definition and I looked at eye rolling and he goes, oh yeah, you do that. And I was not even aware that when I get frustrated or get blocked or something that that is one of my responses I do. So that was really good awareness for me. And then retaliating. Sometimes we want to just get even. We wanted that fairness things comes out and we want to get even with people. And then the passive destructive are more um, the avoiding, just not wanting to deal with it, hoping it'll go away. And the yielding, which is um, things that, that we sometimes think this is compromise, but it actually is giving up something that's really important to us to the point that we're resentful about it afterwards. So we can tell we've yielded if there's something that afterwards we're kind of going, fine. Or um, there's a, there's a um, resentment that we gave up something that was really important to us about this situation. And then hiding emotions. So that, you know, just thinking that we're not going to express it and it's not appropriate, so I'm going to hide them all. But they come out non-verbally all the time. And we think we're hiding them, but people pick them up. And then the last one here is self-criticizing. And where is it after the conflict, we tend to just start getting down on ourselves and really um, getting uh, kind of self-critical about, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, why did I, you know, why didn't I say this? And oftentimes that turns the attention on ourselves in a way that we don't have enough attention out there to really deal with the other person or resolve the conflict construct constructively, and it just becomes all about our internal process. So I just want to cl close here with a, a couple of slides. Um, it says, did you know the ocean gets its saltiness from the tears of misunderstood sharks that just want to cuddle? And oftentimes in conflict, we get triggered. Um, anger gets triggered. Frustration gets triggered. And we start getting the worst of each other. And we assume you know, not good motives. We assume, you know, things are, are um, not intentionally, you know, going to work out for us. And so because of those assumptions, you know, we get scared, we get nervous, and we're just not coming from our best self. So if sometimes we can really see that defensiveness in the other person as just a protection, a way of them protecting themselves, and try to get curious about what's going on for them and what we can do to help understand what's going on for them as well as communicate what's going on for us, we've got a better chance of working things out. And with the, um, just in closing, I uh, just want to review the stages of learning. Some of you may have seen this. And thinking of your own conflict competence, where are you at with this based on what we've talked about? So the first stage is where we're unconsciously incompetent. So we're blissfully ignorant. We don't know what we don't know. And the second stage is consciously incompetent, where all of a sudden we become aware of, oh my gosh, I didn't know that I didn't know that. And now I'm aware that in order to be deal with conflict more constructively, I need to be less sarcastic, or I need to manage my hot buttons, or something um, that we become aware. And if um, sometimes when we get in that stage, it feels uncomfortable, but celebrate. If you become aware of something like that in this session, just celebrate that that's an awareness now that, that is part of the learning process. 
And then the third one is consciously competent where, okay, I can think about it. If I can think about it, I can do it and I can work through it, but I really have to consciously think about it and practice. And the fourth is unconsciously competent where it's a natural you know, response now that we've worked into. And you may have become aware during this session of things that you are, um, you're naturally competent at. It comes pretty naturally for you. So celebrate those. And then reflective competence is where we can actually communicate to somebody else to help them learn and to help them develop competence in some area that we have competence. So wherever you are in terms of your conflict competence, know that there are ways to practice, there are ways to get better at it. And the CDP is a great starting place in terms of starting to become aware of, you know, what are your strengths and where are some of your maybe blind spots that you want to uh, be able to work a little bit more on. So I'm a firm believer that life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. And oftentimes when we're in conflict, that it really requires us to step into discomfort, but it often really um, produces great results. And uh, this is a final quote from Carl Jung. He says, the most intense conflicts, if overcome, leave behind a sense of security and calm that is not easily disturbed. So if you think of some of the um, most difficult conflicts you've stepped into, even though they've been uncomfortable, that when you've been able to work through it, the relationship just feels much more on solid ground and uh, you're just able to work together in a lot, in lot more different situations um, more effectively. So uh, really uh, appreciate uh, the, the chance to share some thoughts. And now if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer some. Thank you, Stephanie. That was a great quote. This is Jean again, and we've got a few questions here. If anyone here uh, has the opportunity to type in one that maybe you're thinking about while we're going on, that's great. Feel free to do so. So the first question we have is, do you have any tips for creating a new habitual response? Yeah. So first of all, notice um, the kinds of situations where you get triggered because that will make a difference in terms of what the habitual response is that you might want to create. So, um, so a lot of times I get triggered in uh, situations where I'm dealing with maybe power dynamics. I'm working inside of an organization and we've got all sorts of levels of, of positional power in the organization and there starts to be some conflict between um, people in the organ organization or maybe with something that I'm you know, saying or bringing in terms of data or something that people disagree with. And so um, to find out what is going to work in that situation. So a habitual response of taking a walk might be really good for some people in some situation. In that situation, I can't just leave and take a walk because that's not going to work in that situation. But taking a breath what, you know, does work for me. So oftentimes I really um, will often you know, sit up a little straighter and just take a deep breath and start to get aware, even awareness of, for me, noticing where in my body am I feeling the stress and then do what I can to kind of dissipate that and keep um, clear in terms of my goal. So I think you've got to be aware of the trigger. When is it, what kind of situation is it often um, triggered in? And then what kind of habitual response will work in the context of that situation where you're triggered? Great. I think that answered it well. Here's another question I think is kind of fun. I heard you say that we are all responsible for our own actions. So when my hot button is pushed, especially when a coworker comes into work and lets us all know he or she is in a bad mood and wants to be left alone, it's like we're supposed to tiptoe around this person in their mood all day. What can I do to better manage my actions? Yeah, great question. Um, I think we've probably all been there. And whether the coworker says it overtly or just says it through body language, we can read it. And uh, don't pretend, I don't pretend this is easy. But it is interesting that viscerally we often respond emotionally to other people's emotions. We're, we're wired that way as human beings to care about one another, which on, you know, in, one, in some situations are great. In other situations, sometimes we tend to care too much. So um, one of the things that, that might work for me in that situation is just going, okay, interesting. This person's having 
you know, not, you know, having a bad day or things aren't, you know, working out well for them or something. But in not to to feel like I have to totally change the way I'm going to respond or I'm going to interact. It's like taking in as data versus, you know, and then dealing with maybe whatever emotion is triggered in terms of anger or they don't have any right to, you know, say that or, you know, who do they think they are or whatever. It's like, okay, I'll take a walk, deal with that. But then I'm not going to totally readjust everything just because that person said that to me. I'm going to choose what my response back is to that. And I, I don't need to go, I don't need to actually lash out back and say, well, no, I'm not going to change my way of being just because you're in a bad mood. You know, it's like, but just noticing that I've got a choice here. I don't, just because they said that, it doesn't mean that I have to respond like that. Good point. Okay, great. Here's another good question. What should you do if you bring up something to a coworker in a one-on-one -on -one situation and you see your coworker totally shut down, get red and heated? Mm. Obviously, you struck a chord, and the feedback was not well received, and it mm. seems like anything you say at this point will not be heard. How do you move yeah. forward? How should you address the situation? Yeah, and that's very hard. You, obviously, just from the cues that you um, discussed, it's like that person has been triggered. They are in an emotional response, and they're probably... Um, you know, not likely to hear anything more from that, from in that, that context. And it could be anger that's been triggered. It could be shame that's been triggered. They're embarrassed about something. And so um, sometimes uh, what I might do is just say, you know, boy, it looks like this took you by surprise. Um, I, you know, my, a lot of times when I'm talking about feedback, you know, I really try to, to say what my intent is. My intent is to help us, you know, be more successful. Um, I, you know, it sounds like this was hard for you to hear. Um, should we just take a little break and come back at it in a little bit? Or sometimes we can say, you know, is there, you know, can you tell me a little bit about what it, what it triggered for you? And if they can, you know, share any of their response, sometimes uh, that's helpful in, in, in that moment. Um, but I think just acknowledging the nonverbals and, and feeding back the data you're seeing and the story that you might be making and just check it out with the other person and just see if maybe a break might be appropriate or if they can, um, you know, really realize, you know, if your intention was more positive and they can kind of take that in, even though the, 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 in, the feedback was hard to hear, um, sometimes that can settle them down to a place where they can actually discuss it more, but you kind of have to read it based on their response and their nonverbals. Okay. We have a few more. Let's see if I can get one or two in and we'll take our, and take, see what time we have left. Um, how do you not take things personally? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. And I think it's a, it's a hard question. Um, I always believe that 95% of what happens in the world is not personal. And I am better taking, uh, taking the 5% that is personal as if it weren't. But one of the things that helps me is just, again, that I'm not center of the universe. And when we take things personal, we're actually making ourselves center of the universe. And even when people are targeting us and they look like they're mad at us and they're saying, you caused this and you did this, it's like something has been triggered in them that they don't know how to deal with. And the only way they've learned how to deal with is to put it out here and lash out and whatever. But even so, it's still not about you in terms of your worth as a person. Now, there might be a behavior that triggered something for them, and there might be some things you can talk through and work through and learn that might you can do things differently. But obviously, when we take things personally, it's shifted from it's about a behavior and action into our worth as a person. And there's really nothing that we can do um, that changes our worth as a person. We, we really are, you know, innately worthy, valuable individuals. And so sometimes reminding ourselves of that, that we all make mistakes, we all have, you know, imperfections, all those kind of things. And then just, you know, kind of get focused back on what's the behavior, what's the situation, what can we do to make this situation better. 
because some other research from the conflict dynamics profile said that conflict really gets escalated when it becomes person focused versus task focus. So we want to refocus it on the task, take it off ourselves, take it off the other person, and get back on the task or the outcome. And that can help diffuse that, that situation where we end up kind of taking it personal. Good. Um, here's another one. This is not so much about one-on-one, -on -one, but how do you remove, resolve, be in the middle of an ongoing conflict between two other people? Ah, the easy answer is step aside. <laughs> <laughs> not always so easy, though. Um, so I, I will say I often find myself in the middle of conflict, and I, I did have to ask myself at one point in my life, why do I find myself in the middle of conflict? What am I doing that sometimes puts myself in the middle of the conflict? Um, and so starting to kind of own my own behavior and um, realize that sometimes I step in because I am uncomfortable with conflict and I want to help and get it resolved versus realizing, you know what, it is between these two people and they need to work through it. And me being in the middle sometimes actually is preventing them from working through it. And if I am in the middle, I need to be really clear about what my role is and make sure it's a constructive role in terms of um, getting the issues on the table and getting the things uh, worked out. But oftentimes, you know, there is, an, there is a reason that I'm in the middle that I got to own. It's kind of like my own unspoken agenda for being there. And once I become aware of that, sometimes it really makes it easier to, to step out of the middle or be in the middle in a way that's more productive. Time for just one more question. Someone writes in, is there a way to practice? You usually don't have time in a conflict situation to think and provide a measured response. Yeah, isn't that the truth? So uh, one thing that comes to mind is when we're, we're all waiting in traffic, and, uh, and somebody does something in the moment where they cut in front of us in, in a car or uh, we're just sitting there waiting and we're frustrated and we're impatient, noticing those triggered, those responses that get us triggered and um, practice cooling ourselves down, practice really, um, you know, dealing with things that will help us calm down. Um, and, and it's a great place to practice because we got plenty of time while we're in the car or waiting in line. Um, or even when we hear about such other situations people are in, noticing your reactions and, and just starting to practice ways to cool yourself down and get back in a more kind of reasoned uh, response thing. So if you start thinking about it, you will find you will find all sorts of situations where you are triggered and then just start to become aware of those in practice. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for that wonderful presentation. I learned so much and hope you all did as well. My name is Julia Degan, and I'm a learner representative in the College of Continuing Education, and I'm your point of contact. So if you have any questions about the webinar and about our professional development courses and certificate programs, please feel free to email or call me. I'm more than happy to help you and can even help you register for your next course and or certificate program. And there are some upcoming courses that Stephanie teaches. We have Principles of Supervision, which is a course offering in our supervision certificate that will be happening in July. We also have Fundamentals of Organization Development, a course offering in our organization development certificate happening in August. And another organization development course, um, it's called In-Depth Coaching, Lead Individual Change Interventions, and that will be happening in September. And these are just a few courses that we offer in our portfolio, so please view the link that we have listed for you to view a listing of all the courses that we offer in our certificate program, such as project management, communications, business writing, management practices, just to name a few. Um, I would like to thank you all for attending today's event. And we'll be sending out an email in the next few days with a link to the presentation. In that email, we'll also be providing a survey. So we deeply appreciate any suggestions you may have regarding the webinar. Um, this would include any suggestions you may have for topic, uh, topic suggestions for future events. So again, thank you all for attending, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again.